Arizona, a state defined by deserts, the Grand Canyon, more deserts, the Four Corners, even more deserts, a dry climate with the occasional flooding that can occur from like an inch or two of rainfall, and of course, some random YouTuber who I've watched since he had like 10,000 subscribers or something. But if I were to tell you tornadoes, you would rightly slap me across the face and ask me if I was strapped on my head as a child. But it's true. Severe weather across the southwestern United States is beyond unusual. I mean, the occasional tornado does happen once in a while there, but a full-on tornado outbreak is pretty much unheard of in that general area. Well, except for one instance. In October of 2010, an extremely unusual severe weather outbreak occurred in Arizona, accompanied with a large flooding event that occurred in the southwestern United States. A total of 12 tornadoes. Not a lot of tornadoes for an outbreak in the grand scheme of things, but, given its location, it was the largest tornado outbreak observed west of the Rocky Mountains. A large hailstorm was also observed with the storm system, with hail as large as 3 inches in diameter falling onto the ground below, specifically near Phoenix, causing $2.6 billion in damages alone. In total, the storms would cause $4.9 billion in damages, becoming the costliest weather event to ever occur in the state of Arizona. Considering the odd circumstances surrounding the outbreak and its location, I believe it is worth looking into this event in detail. Today, I will be looking into the October 2010 Arizona tornado outbreak and hailstorm, talking about the severe weather that had already occurred that year, the synopsis, the event itself, and the aftermath. Welcome to Nature's Fury. 2010 was a year that had plenty of severe weather events throughout. To prevent myself from going too long like the Atlanta tornado video, I will be going over the major outbreaks of the year briefly. The first major tornado outbreak occurred from April 22nd through the 25th, where a total of 88 tornadoes touched down across the Central Plains and the Southern United States, including an EF-4 tornado that tore through Yazoo City, Mississippi. There was another outbreak four days later from April 29th through May 2nd, where a number of tornadoes touched down across the Central Plains, Midwest, and Lower Mississippi Valley. In May, there was an intense tornado outbreak that spawned multiple significant tornadoes from May 10th through the 13th, including two EF-4 tornadoes, with one of those hitting Norman, Oklahoma. From May 22nd through the 25th, an outbreak of tornadoes occurred in the Northern Plains, including an EF-4 tornado near Boulder, South Dakota. From June 5th through the 6th, a number of tornadoes occurred across the Midwest and the Upper Ohio River Valley, including an EF-4 tornado that occurred in Millbury, Ohio. The most significant tornado event of the year occurred from June 16th through the 17th, where a total of 82 tornadoes touched down across the Northern Plains, including four EF-4 tornadoes across North Dakota and Minnesota. The most violent tornadoes from a single outbreak at this time since the 2008 Super Tuesday outbreak. A small outbreak occurred from June 25th through the 26th, although said small outbreak did include an EF-4 tornado that occurred in Iowa. No major outbreaks occurred in July, but on August 7th, several tornadoes touched down in the Northern Plains and Midwest, including an EF-4 tornado near Tyler, North Dakota. From thenceforth, there weren't many other major tornado outbreaks that occurred that year until October. 2010 had a number of significant weather events that I will definitely look into later on, especially the outbreaks in June. As October came, severe weather was definitely not the primary concern of most Americans at this time. But of course, Mother Nature had other plans. Plans that ultimately were even more bizarre than your typical tornado outbreak. Though, real quick, not a lot of people who like these videos are subscribed to the channel, so if you enjoy the videos that I do, consider subscribing. It helps me a lot and tells me I'm doing something right. Anyways, back to the Arizona tornado outbreak. Okay, so this segment will be longer than usual because there's a lot more I have to talk about because we need to talk about severe weather outbreaks in the southwest in general. If you haven't been living under a rock, you might be aware that any tornado event west of the Rocky Mountains is rare, to put it lightly. This is because of the general lack of moisture in the areas outside of the Pacific Northwest. But the Pacific Northwest has its own problems such as temperatures and a bunch of other stuff that I don't want to get into here. Basically, if you have any knowledge of climate norms of the different subsections of the US, you probably already knew that the southwestern United States doesn't get a lot of severe weather. 
However, there have been tornado events that have occurred in the southwestern US before this point. A paper written by David Bancard, who worked for NWS Flagstaff at the time, wrote a paper titled Synoptic Environments Associated with Tornadoes in Northern Arizona. The paper examined 75 tornado days in the state from 1950 through 2006, and discovered some trends that came along with those tornado days in particular. Regarding the cool season tornado days, of which there were 38, a cold core low-level pressure system was embedded in the mid-latitude westerlies with North Arizona being in the warm sector. The positioning of the low pressure system in the warm sector allows for moist, tropical air from the Pacific Ocean to reach into Arizona. With this came instability and additional lift. The median instability was found to be at roughly 450 joules per kilogram, enough instability for supercellular thunderstorms, provided there was enough wind shear. For these setups, the low pressure systems, detached from the jet stream, provided ample southerly shear into Arizona. These trends are present across multiple tornado outbreaks in the southwestern United States, even with how rare they are. So what occurred with the October 2010 outbreak? Something very similar to previous tornado events that had already occurred in Arizona to this point. An omega block was present across the country, characterized by a high pressure system over the central US and two cold core low pressure systems, one near West Virginia and one off the coast of California. The Storm Prediction Center initially did not forecast much from the event itself, with a slight risk issued on October 5th and the 6th. The 5th had no tornadoes from the outbreak, but surface dew points near 60 degrees allowed for thunderstorm development near Phoenix, Arizona, something I will cover shortly. But the 6th was not expected to be a day worth writing home about. Originally, a general thunderstorm risk was issued for Arizona because the severe threat was expected to wane later in the day. Instability was expected to rise to around 500 to 1000 joules per kilogram in the early morning hours, but the severe weather potential was expected to decrease in the afternoon hours. However, during the pre-dawn hours, the low pressure system retrograded to the west-northwest, extending the window of time for severe weather to occur. In the early morning hours, storm relative helicity values in excess of 200 meters squared per second squared and bulk shear in excess of 60 knots at the 500 millibar level were observed in Arizona, with dew points ranging from the 40s into the 60s. The factors just stated indicated that there was an unstable environment that had the ability to produce supercell thunderstorms in a corridor in central and northern Arizona. If the low pressure system did not retrograde, there was a high likelihood that this event would not have been as severe as it turned out to be. So with the synopsis done, the events began to unfold, starting with a non-tornadic event on the 5th. On October 5th, the main story coming out of Arizona that day regarding severe weather was not tornadoes, but rather, one of the costliest hailstorms in US history. Throughout the early morning hours of the 5th, thunderstorms produced small hail across portions of central and northern Arizona. This associated with the cold core low off the coast of California. Midday, the SBC issued a severe thunderstorm watch for Arizona, citing the threats of strong winds, but hail was the primary threat. Around 1.30 p.m., a multi-cell cluster of storms moved through the Phoenix metro area, dropping some small hail again and causing flash flooding in the area. But the worst of the hail storm came from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Large hail, ranging from 1.75 inches in diameter to 3 inches in diameter, battered the Phoenix metro area, alongside other communities and portions of Arizona. Loud noises of the chunks of ice smashing onto the ground below, onto the cars below, onto the buildings below. The loud noises of hail falling into the ground was the only thing audible in the Phoenix Metro for a short time. In total, the hailstorm itself was responsible for at least $2.6 billion in damages, at least according to insurance claims. Looking at the footage from the hailstorm, it's one of the most impressive hailstorms I've ever witnessed myself, especially for where it occurred. Early on October 6th, environmental conditions were already overperforming due to the retrograding of the cold core low over the California coastline. Temperatures were in the mid-60s into portions of the upper 70s in some locations. 
dew points weren't amazing, ranging from the low 40s into portions of the low 60s across central Arizona. Despite the low amounts of moisture in the atmosphere, it was just barely enough for supercell thunderstorms to develop. The bulk shear at the 500 millibar level was strong and supported rotating thunderstorms, with bulk shear ranging from 50 to near 70 knots across much of Arizona. Cape was also present, ranging from 500 to 1,000 joules per kilogram, enough instability to support the potential for severe weather. It was only a matter of time before thunderstorms would develop. The supercells began to show signs of rotation before the tornadoes touched down. It's thought that the mountainous terrain south of the Flagstaff metro area may have inhibited some tornadic development early on. But at 4.55 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, the first significant tornado of the day touched down. The first tornado of the day touched down north of Payson, Arizona, moving towards the north-northeast for 14.8 miles, going through mostly forest land, blowing down hundreds of Pondicera pine trees, and at least one alligator juniper that was two and a half feet in diameter was snapped off. The tornado itself had a peak width of 400 yards, and the most significant impacts the tornado had on human life was downing trees on a state Route 87. Nine miles south-southwest of Bellamont, Arizona, a tornado touched down and began producing EF2 damage, downing trees as it moved through mostly forest land, with complete destruction of the forest with all trees felled in the area for hundreds of yards. The tornado cycled, touching back down and would remain on the ground for a total of 26 miles. The tornado first struck an RV dealership, causing structural damage to the building, and anywhere between 30 and 40 RVs were destroyed. The tornado passed within two-thirds of a mile from the NWS Flagstaff office. The first of three close calls that NWS Flagstaff had with the tornadoes from this day. The tornado proceeded to cross over I-40, snapping multiple power poles before moving into the Flagstaff Meadows neighborhood. In the neighborhood, 100 houses suffered damage, with 21 of those suffering heavy damage or were destroyed completely. Seven were injured in the neighborhood. From thenceforth, the tornado continued into mostly forest land, moving northward for 14.7 miles before entering a burn scar. The burn scar had an anemometer, which read a 3 second wind speed of 115 miles per hour, a 1 second wind speed of 161 miles per hour, and an instantaneous wind speed of 185 miles per hour. However, there was no damage near the burn scar to correlate with any wind speeds. The tornado continued north for another mile and a half before lifting 20 miles north-northwest of Flagstaff. The East Bellamont tornado traveled a total of 26 miles with a peak width of 500 yards, injuring seven. At 5.55 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, a large tornado touched out 15 miles south of Bellamont. The tornado proceeded to move practically parallel to the first tornado spawned by the cell that produced the Eastern Bellamont tornado. The tornado quickly began producing heavy tree destruction where it touched down and as it moved further north. While moving northward, the tornado passed within one-third of a mile of the NWS Flagstaff office. The tornado moved through Camp Navajo, where minor structural damage occurred, before moving through Bellamont, where 28 rail cars were derailed. However, damage was minimal otherwise. The tornado continued moving towards the north after hitting Bellamont, lifting after crossing US Route 180. The tornado was initially rated an EF2, but was later upgraded to an EF3 due to the complete tree destruction observed south of Bellamont. The tornado was massive with a peak width of 800 yards. Despite the fierce intensity of the tornado, damages were minimal due to the sparsely populated area. Just as the EF3 tornado lifted, another EF2 tornado touched down in close proximity to where the other tornadoes near Bellamont tracked, and passed within two miles of the NWS office before dissipating. This marked the third significant tornado to pass by the office that morning, all within walking distance from their front door. The majority of the damage came from tree damage, thankfully. However, some officials believe that this tornado may have been composed of multiple smaller tornadoes, a so-called tornado family, with the strongest of the bunch being the aforementioned EF2. However, the strongest tornado of the day occurred at 11.20 a.m., where an EF3 tornado touched down near Appaloosa Ridge. The tornado was on the ground briefly, only traveling for four miles. 
The tornado had a peak width of 1,100 yards, striking three transmission towers, including one that was completely flattened. The tornado had winds near 165 miles per hour, a borderline EF4, and despite it doing no damage outside of the transmission towers, what's considered to be the Tuba City EF3 is one of the strongest tornadoes in Arizona state history. As the events progressed into the late morning hours, conditions began to deteriorate for tornadic development. There were a few tornadoes that occurred after 7 a.m., most of those being weak with the exception of the Tuba City EF3. Notably, there was a tornado that was observed in Utah in the afternoon hours. While the threat of tornadoes was over, severe winds and hail were observed in Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. Flash flooding also occurred across portions of California, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah due to the constant flow of moist air from the cold core low pressure system. After the storms moved through, damage surveys began to be conducted, and speculations about the possibility of this tornado outbreak being the largest in the state of Arizona's history was confirmed. The majority of impacts from the tornado outbreak were relatively minor, all things considered. Most of the tornadoes went through forest land, meaning that actual damages from the tornadoes themselves were relatively small. Only seven injuries were attributed to the tornado outbreak. The worst of the damage came from the tornadoes that went through Bellamont, specifically in the Flagstaff Meadows neighborhood, the RV store, and the transmission towers near Tuba City. In total, 12 tornadoes touched down in the southwestern United States from this outbreak, the largest tornado outbreak observed west of the Rocky Mountains. 11 in Arizona, a record for the most tornadoes from a single outbreak in the state of Arizona. Of those tornadoes, there were 4 EF2s and 2 EF3s. The 12th tornado was a small, short-lived EF0 in south-central Utah, but hey, it still counts towards the total for the outbreak as a whole. Although the exact number of tornadoes depends on where you look, and I would at least like to talk about the discrepancies between resources here just for a little bit. While researching this outbreak, one of the major sources I used was the Tornado Talk article, and the article mentioned that the numbers from the SPC Tornado Report database actually differs from what the NWS says. So what is actually responsible for the discrepancies here? Well, what essentially happened is that the SBC database was the original survey's results. However, in 2019, NWS Flagstaff compiled the storm data entries of tornadoes and compiled all the storm survey findings from nearly 10 years prior. The numbers I'm using in this video is from the National Weather Service. While the SBC website still states that there are 8 tornadoes from this outbreak with 11 reports. This only really asks the question of how many events have this same issue? Events where the SPC database either over or under reports the amount of tornadoes due to the data being outdated. Now as to whether or not I can say if there are other outbreaks that suffer from this, I can't tell you for sure. But I think it's about time to wrap this up. The October 6th tornado outbreak across Arizona is an outbreak that is not talked about much today, and I understand why. The overall human impact from this outbreak was very minimal, besides the fact that Mother Nature really hated NWS Flagstaff's office that day. However, the fact that such an outbreak even occurred west of the Rocky Mountains makes the October 6th tornado outbreak warrant a serious discussion. Tornadoes don't have to happen in Dixie Alley or Tornado Alley in order to be destructive, and that is evident with this outbreak. While the tornadoes did not hit any major residential areas, half of the tornadoes were rated EF2 or higher. Eastern Flagstaff did get hit by a tornado that day, but it was only an EF0, producing minimal damage. The meteorological synopsis of this outbreak is fascinating enough to warrant a breakdown of this event, but the sheer violence of the tornadoes, despite the minimal impacts to life and property, further cements the importance of this event to tornado enthusiasts. An event that I believe should be talked about more often, especially given its location, and one that I will definitely not forget anytime soon. First of all, thank you for the support lately. The feedback on the Sandy documentary has been immensely positive and I cannot say my thanks enough. If only YouTube didn't kill it in the span of a couple hours for no reason other than just to make me suffer. I took a small break to just kind of chill over the past few weeks, and now that I'm back to this, I feel so much better now. Regarding future videos, the schedule will go on as normal, with a video on the November 2013 tornado outbreak being my next target, and then likely a video on Bridge Creek Moor, and that whole tornado outbreak. 
a video on Noonan, a video on Ada, and then a recap of what I've done this year and doing corrections as I go along. Special thanks to my proofreaders, Rishi and Alice, to help prevent me from sounding like an idiot. I do want to mention I have a Discord server where I talk infrequently, and a lot of people don't know it exists, but link to that in the description. Shoutouts to those who are subscribed to the channel's Patreon, those being Montpellier in the Elfie's Army tier, and Avery Teoda, Worm Off the String, and Ace Cooper on the Elf Mini tier. If you want to support me financially while getting perks like access to my scripts and hopefully some exclusive videos at some point, then consider subscribing to the channel Patreon. Anyways, I don't have much else to say. If you enjoy what I do, consider subscribing, liking the video, commenting your thoughts, and sharing it around. I appreciate it a lot. That being said, I'm Alfaria. I hope you all enjoyed the video. You all have a safe night, and I'll see you all next time.